So good evening and welcome to this um, uh, celebration, this event tonight, which is actually uh, uh, closing a series of events which has celebrated the 15th anniversary of BioIn. Dear ministers, dear professors, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear members of the board of BioIn, uh, welcome to this event tonight. I'm Philippe de Noël, I'm head of external R&D at GSK, and um, I'm also the lucky chairperson of the board of BioWin. Tonight, I would have loved, actually, that Jean-Pierre Delouart, who is the, uh, the second chairperson of BioWin, succeeding to Jean-Stéphane, uh, I would have loved that Jean-Pierre was with us. Uh, he wanted to be with us. He wanted to tell you about the history of BioWin, but unfortunately, Jean-Pierre is suffering from a disease that is well known to all of you, and, um, and, and he cannot be with us tonight. So uh, let's, um, well, first of all, let's wish Jean-Pierre a, a speedy and good recovery. But the good news is that he sent me his speech, which means that I'm going to do a bit like, uh, you know, when uh, someone receives a prize, the Oscar ceremony, I'm going to read the thank you from Jean-Pierre. And this is how it starts. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here to celebrate the 15 years of existence of BioIn, the Walloon region's health cluster. 17 years ago, I remember as if it was yesterday, a call from Jean Stéphane who asked, who asked me to come with him and others to Paris to study the French policy of clustering. He also asked me to bring in to bring in other biotech entrepreneurs. I, invi I invited Dr. Philippe Gabon, then CEO of Delphi Genetics, to join us. Thus, a group of pharmaceutical and biotech companies, managers, under the leadership of the then Minister of Economy of the Walloon region, Jean-Claude Marcourt, and led by Damien Dalmagne, from the consulting firm Arthur D. D. Little, left for Paris on a beautiful morning in December 2005. A few months later, the so-called Marshall Plan, named after the former US Secretary of State just after World War II, but which could just as easily have been called the Marcourt Plan, was launched. And indeed, Jean-Claude Marcourt and his cabinet, led by Benoit Bayonnet, have put a lot of energy into this plan. Of the five clusters created at that time, the cluster bringing together pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies and universities active in these disciplines was to be called BioIn. The cluster project was and it still is very much supported by the Union Wallonne des Entreprises and in particular by the chairman of its research committee at that time, Dr. Yves Jongen. The two major pharmaceutical companies established in the Walloon region were leading the way with their respective CEOs, Jean-Stéphane for GSK and Roque d'Oliveux for UCB, followed by many small companies. The universities, uh, represented on the board by Dr. Michel Goldman, vice chairman, who has been involved from day one together with UCL, UC Louvain, and University of Liège, also present on the board. To get this ambitious project off the ground, we were able to count on the invaluable help of Pierre Ozer from GSK and Simon Dress, as well as Didier Malherbe from UCB, who spent countless hours to make the project a success. I would also like to mention Luc Van Steenkist, who is here tonight, who, has, who was the first chairman of the Walloon region government's independent jury which had to rule on the policy of the clusters as well as on the labeling of research projects. He devoted himself to this task with great rigor and professionalism. BioWin was born with a great ambition because next to the, big, the, two, the, next to the two big companies and to the Belgian French-speaking universities, a lot of SMEs believed in the project from the beginning and joined it. Fortunately, the Walloon political authorities have understood the tremendous potential of this initiative and have continued to believe in the project. 
The current Minister of Economy, Mr. Willy Borsu, continues to promote and support the initiative, and thank you to him. And all of this for what? This is what Philippe de Noël, the chairman of BioWin, will tell us now. <laughs> and yes, I think indeed uh, a tremendous project and a big success. 15 years have passed, and over the last 15 years, the health and life science ecosystem has transformed, and, and BioWin has transformed as well. Please note that we have had 59 BioWin research and innovation projects that have led to the creation of several companies that have had a major impact on economy, on employment, but also that have led to the creation of new healthcare solutions that today impact public health. The BioWin members have two times more employees than 15 years ago. In 2006, a bit above 9,000 employees, and today above 19,000 employees in the members of BioWin. The added value of the companies has grown from 1.4 billion euros to 8.5 billion euros in 2020. We, had five, well, we were five big pharma companies at the time when BioWin was created, and today we have 11 large pharma or large biopharma companies as members of BioWin. Let's not forget about the SME members who have been very successful in raising capital because over 3 billion euros in private capital have been raised during the last 15 years from those small and medium companies, biotech companies. I would also like to highlight that this has been made possible thanks to the effort, first of all, of a great board of BioWin with the universities represented, with SMEs, large pharma, large biopharma companies, and our research center, CER, also. Uh, I want to give a special thank you to Hugues Bulto, who is the vice president representing the biotech companies, and to Serge Schiffman, who is representing the universities on our board, for their efforts and their support. But I also would like that together we thank Sylvie Ponchot, the director of BioWin, and her team, because all has been possible only because of this great team. So let's give them a big round of applause. I also would like to say uh, that today we have um, great opportunities, uh, but we also have important challenges ahead of us. And this includes talent development. And, and those of you who have followed the recent history of BioWin have seen how public, the public and the private working together can come up with invent innovative and new solutions to tackle the talent development and the talent shortage issue that we currently have in our region. Another important challenge is the integration of the digital and of the environmental transition into our company's strategies. And linking to today's theme of the debate, uh, the environmental, the social, and the governance proposition of companies is becoming increasingly important. And its link to value creation will actually be the subject of the discussion. And Luc van Steenkist has kindly agreed to moderate uh, this discussion Thank you very much, Luc. Uh, you are very well known to most of us here, but I think I still need to remind you that Luc has occupied several top responsibility positions in many companies, including Recticel. Luc was also the, the, the chairman of FEB FWO. Uh, Luc also served as the director and chairman of several national and international companies. And Luc was also the chairperson of the Prince Philip uh, Fund. Thank you very, very much, Luc, again, for accepting to lead this interesting discussion. And I would like to end this very short introduction, I hope it was short, by welcoming on stage the panelists who have kindly accepted to discuss this important topic. So please welcome Veronique Tully from UCB, Treuke Verkreuz from Belfius, Guilain Boyer from Euronext, and Thomas Canon from IBA, and Luc, over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. So, 
ladies and gentlemen. Allow me as an introduction to give you a little bit information about the state of play of the subject that is called commonly ESG and that is the hot topic for many companies today. First buzzword is taxonomy. Taxonomy was a regulation that has been created by the European Commission in 2020 and was a set of rules to be applied by financial institutions in, and defined a number of zones of activity in which we should invest in the future to make the Green Deal successfully happening. First element, taxonomy. Second element is CSRD, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. It was made regulated by the European Commission one year later, 2021. And it basically obliges companies to report on sustainability. Very easy to put in your memory. The companies that are obliged to do so are stock quoted companies on regulated markets and exclude microcaps. That's the second buzzword you have to put in your head. The third one is ESG. ESG is environment, uh, uh, social and governance, and is basically what is sustainability about. So if you have those three words, you will follow the whole of the evening, I think, very easily. Another information is EFRAC. EFRAC has been asked by the European Commission to make standards for that reporting. And those standards are in the make. They have been made, are now for the moment in the market for consultation. EFRAC was basically in the past an institution created on demand from the European Commission to elaborate the standards on accounting. So the global, European, global world standards that are standardizing all the accountant, accountancy elements have been made by EFRAC for what concerns Europe. Now, to make it a little bit complicated, Europe expects us to make those standards. I am sitting on the board of EFRAC as one of the board members. Uh, on the other ones are many people. There are NGOs, there are unions, there are regulators, there are uh, companies, groups presenting companies, so quoted and non-quoted, big and small. There is a group representing the banks and the insurers and so on. So it's a multiple forum for the global community on the standards to be made or to report it on tomorrow. The European Union expects us to make and these standards final before the end of this year. Now, to make it complicated, there is somebody else also making standards. And the one that is making those standards is the International ESSB Board, the International Sustainability Standards Board, that is a board that is, exists like IFRS, which was the international accounting group, is based on information coming from all the big economical entities of the world. That means Africa, um, Russia, China, Europe, Great Britain, United Kingdom, um, USA. All of them are basically in that group or have fed with their comments the making of those international standards. The aim of this group is also to make his standards ready for the end of this year. Now, the European Council, to make it a little bit more complicated, has asked that the standards that are made by the European group, EFRAC, should not be in contradiction with the international ones. So they can be different, but they should not be in contradiction, which is, by the way, a wise demand, which it would make it... But you have already a flavor. It's clear that the international standards will probably be more softer than the European ones, or could be more softer. We don't know. We will know at the end of the year. Also, they want to have their standards finished because otherwise there will be collision between the two before the end of this year. That's the name, that's the game in which we are playing. Now, when I am a small SME, and I am not, I am quoted, but I am a microcap, should I then care about this complexity? Because the standards will be handed over end of the year to the European Commission. They will debate for a year, which is cl the classical way. And so the standards will only be, become applicable as from two, 20, 2024 on. So I'm a small SME, or I'm a microcap on the stock exchange. Should I do something? Should I simply wait? Is that not the most easiest solution for me? Or can I, and can I simply 
let the big ones solve their problems. We will, uh, we will have the other ones. Uh, we will come when it, it's our time to come. And I, in the way, anyway, I am not subject to the reporting issue, so I will not be touched. So my first question is to the representative of the financial institutions, the lady from Belfius. Can you explain us a little bit what is the link between taxonomy and ESG? And second, do you really think that everything is under control, that the companies can wait and, until everything pops up in 2024? Or are you already today finding out that there are a lot of problems that you cannot handle with your responsibility because taxonomy is already a regulation you have to follow as financial institutions? Okay. <laughs> How much time do I have to uh, reply? Well, you, have all the, you have all the time. As long <laughs> no. as they listen, you have all the time. <laughs> okay, so maybe first on the taxonomy, why is it important? Well, I think um, actually taxonomy is a, a very positive uh, fact. Huh? Uh, you explained, Luke, what taxonomy is. So I think that's, that's more or less clear. But taxonomy is really the one common language that should uh, prevent uh, companies from greenwashing or even green wishing, eh? because it's not always intentionally that people uh, start to greenwash. Sometimes they are just not aware of what is sustainable and what is not. So their taxonomy has a really, really important role to play. And actually, um, but I'm speaking for Belfius to us, it's a positive thing that this exists, because it's a compass, it helps us in guiding our clients. And we are really trying to have all our customers on board of the, the sustainable transition. And that's where taxonomy gives clear definitions on uh, sustainable economic activities, which ones do we have to support. But also, and that's a very important principle of taxonomy, the do no significant harm principle. And so it's not only about what is considered as being sustainable, but it's also if you are uh, supporting sustainable activities, please make sure that you do no significant harm to other important activities. So that's, I'm a big fan of taxonomy, so quite surprisingly. Um, the other question uh, was more like if it's all about good news, is everybody ready? So uh, there, if, <laughs> if we are honest, I don't think it's, uh, we're there yet. Huh? Uh, at least we're convinced of the importance, but there are several hurdles today, uh, especially in um, uh, also what, what you already mentioned. Eh? For SMEs, for example, it's not clear where they have to go. Uh, do they uh, have to uh, respect the, the taxonomy regulation and all the other regulations or not? So there we're a bit in a situation where, for example, as a bank, we need to report on all our sustainable activities, but we are very much depending on the availability of data from our customers. Those data aren't there yet. So we have a, a big, big, big data issue. Uh, it's a global issue. It's not only for Belfuse, it's not only for Belgium. It's, it's, it's really a European issue, or maybe broader. Um, but there are some specific elements for Belgium as well, but we, we can uh, elaborate on that later on. So are we there yet? No. There is a lack of data, there is a mismatch, I'm sorry, in the regulation uh, at European level eh, because they are forcing certain reportings uh, before the data is available and so it's often linked to data. And I think it's just for the moment everybody uh, knows that they will have to shift towards more sustainability but we're not there yet with aligned methodologies, available data, etc. So the the challenge remains huge, but I am convinced that we will get there, and I'm also convinced of the, the role that financial institutions can play in this transition. It's a little bit like Europe is a little bit misusing the financial institutions yeah. as being the policeman of the financing of the companies of tomorrow if they are not considered as being sustainable. So they will be in a situation, are you already there today? Or can well, you, have yeah. you already to block financing of companies? Um, as yeah. banks as a whole, I mean as a whole, we, like I'm not talking mm -hmm. about Belfius and... No, 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 I know. Uh, well, I think, first of all, it's not only policemen. And, uh, I, I, uh, I often say that if Europe wants to realize their net zero ambition, it's 
mainly through the financial sector because yeah. they use the financial sector as a, as a lever, as a, an accelerator to uh, go through the transition. And as you say, we have the role of policeman, auditor, financer, sometimes mecenas. Uh, we have to control everything and we have to make it happen. So there's also a positive side. Eh? It's, it, the enabling part is positive. Are we there yet? Well, yes, uh, we're starting to look, uh, for example, at Belfius, we have, um, we call it transition acceleration policies. So that's our uh, sector policy that should help us in making the transition possible, but also in which sectors do we consider as really not sustainable, uh, often aligned with taxonomy and uh, where we will have to look for other uh, solutions if they can't make the necessary transition. And we'll have to start reporting very transparently on all those uh, activities. Yeah. So I turn to Rislein Boyer. Euronix, you, the, the stock exchanges are in the middle between the companies and the investors. The investors want a simple system of clarity, tell me where to, have to invest, and the companies have to provide all the, all the data. That's in a nutshell what is happening. What do you feel today um, as happening with uh, the companies? Should they really wait for the standards to be made first and then act? Uh, can SMEs escape uh, from the whole system? Uh, what is your, your, um, your feeling about how the companies react today in relation to the obligations that will come tomorrow? Um, at first, uh, I have to say that we observe at Euronex there is a a real and intense learning curve uh, from the financial ecosystem, including banks, including uh, issuers, investors, etc. Of course, regarding regulation, regarding best practice, regarding maturity from the different players of the market, we have a certain uh, and a real heterogeneity uh, for uh, capabilities. So that's the case for SMEs. Uh, that's also a question of capabilities for the smaller investors uh, for the moment. Uh, is a, a financial institution with, I don't know, four or five fund managers with the support of one or two buy-side analysts, uh, do they have the skills to uh, appreciate uh, an ESG roadmap or a sustainability commitment from a, from a company? That's a, a very good question. Uh, as Truka mentioned, there is a big issue and we think at Euronext for the moment, the main issue is related to ESG data. Uh, so this is the, the very hot topic of the moment. Um, so we observe a learning curve, definitely. We also observe from the point of view of the issuers, small, mid, large caps, and for, from all the industries, a real um, raising awareness also to this topic. Um, however, they are not equal uh, to, the, um, to the challenge, uh, especially with staffing, skills, and also industries. Some of them, uh, as Truka mentioned, are more uh, involved or exposed to the uh, climate uh, uh, transition or uh, environmental issues, social issues for, for, for someone. Uh, maybe to conclude with this, uh, with this question, uh, I would say, something, and I'm sure that uh, um, uh, Veronique and, uh, and Thomas will, will confirm, it's not all about financing and investment. When you are a company, you have stakeholders, employees, clients, partners, suppliers, communities, etc., etc. So, of course, regulation is mainly focused at the moment on how financing and investment can contribute to climate transition and net zero initiative, etc. But focus only on expectations from shareholders or from banks for a company to decide to uh, uh, assess or not the social and envir environmental issue is a mistake on my point of view. Veronique, you represent one of the big farmers. Um, high capitalization, very active. I have seen you on your report. There is a lot of pages that are talking about ESG. There is a lot of um, telling about what you consider as being important for the future, your future actions on ESG. 
On the other hand, you told me that you have almost no reaction from investors on what you are doing there. So, you are a company in the pharma sector, by definition you are sustainable in, in relation to the fact that you are taking care of the health of the people. So it's one of the elements, the social or even the environmental eventually. You could say, well, I am a, a good player in the game, so if the investors are not really interested in me, I should better stop doing something like that. So I have two questions to you. What is most important for you in the ESG? Is it the E, the S or the G? And second, if the investors don't ask you any questions anyhow, why do you continue? Uh, that's uh, two, uh, two very good questions. And You know, um, first of all, we are completely dependent on what stakeholder wants for a company. Huh? You know, uh, a private company uh, basically is there because we have clients. We have employees, and we have for us, you know, being in the healthcare sector, government, we are happy to pay for what we do, and insurance, we are also going, we are also happy to pay. So, if basically we don't meet their needs, you know, what is the future of a company like UCB? So, um, so for us, you know, looking at stakeholder expectation, and I completely concur to what you said, you know, it's really what is driving us. And for sure, you know, UCB being a biopharmaceutical company, the main stakeholder are the patients with severe disease. And uh, so what are the needs? How can we fulfill them? How can we make sure that patients have access to the drugs that we are, you know, bringing to the market? So are government going to pay for them? Are insurance going to pay for them? That's what clearly, you know, will secure the future of UCB. So, uh, so for us, we, we don't talk so much about ESG, or, you know, even sustainability. We talk about, you know, sustainable performance and a sustainable future for the organization. That is about, you know, of course, driving financial performance, but also creating value for the different stakeholders that we serve. So, um, so the regu the, what you, ex ex you know, explained, taxonomy, the regulation, it's actually a very good guidance, and I am fully aligned with you. I think that it helps us to really, you know, focus on what matters and making sure that, uh, you're right, we are not also lost, you know, in, um, in, the, in the field, but um, we don't do what we do because of regulation. We do it because we want the company to continue to grow and therefore to fulfill expectation of society. And we want to have clients. We want to have young colleagues joining us. And if we don't, you know, fulfill those expectation, we will not have clients anymore. And colleagues will, young generation will not join UCB. So, um, so that's what drives us. It's the future of the company and the future success of the company. It's the demand of society. And I think you were saying, well, yes, do we do it uh, as we see that investors, you know, don't, um, at least the value of the, of the share doesn't seem to be so driven by what we do in terms of, you know, uh, ESG or, 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 you know, societal value creation. Um, you know, it's a long-term future, so when we look at all this, you know, sustainability ambition, it's for the long term, so um, the value of the share in the short term probably doesn't reflect it, but it will, for sure, and we are convinced of that in the future. And it's a continuous dialogue, you know, it's um, when we talk, for example, to bank, I think bank have sometimes so a longer you know, um, horizon compared to investors who are sometimes a bit more short term, you know, uh, rapid trading doesn't help to take into account you know, uh, ESG performance, but, um, but we, um, yes, no, we, we, we just believe that uh, it's the right thing to do for the business and for society and for the value of the company in the long term. Thank you. Then I turn to the other pharma player in this room, IBA. You are smaller in capitalization, but you are also, you are also in technology and equipment for treatment of uh, diseases, let's say, let's call it like that. You could also escape a little bit, but you have decided to, you have you as responsible for the program on IS, uh, ESG, I think, I think since 2020 already. So what is driving you for doing this? Because this all costs money. Have you uh, something that is um, allowing you to defend your job correctly in the strategy of uh, EBA? My, my own job, I don't know, <laughs> I hope so. 
no, but you, 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 the panelist uh, said it all. It's, it's, it's really a matter of stakeholder, taking care of uh, creating shared and sustainable value for all the stakeholders of the company. And we have, as a stakeholder, of course, the customer and the patient. Uh, we have the shareholders, we have the employee. These are three main st uh, stakeholders, but we have also the planet and we have the community. And it's all about trying to create the company value which are uh, long-term for all these stakeholders. So that's, that's the first thing. Then it's about, you know, uh, okay, it's, it's okay to say that we are a sustainable company, but how do we prove it? And that's where come, uh, you know, uh, B, uh, frameworks like B Corp. For instance, B Corp for us is a tool to measure where we are with regards to these uh, five stakeholders. And that's a really a good way. So uh, we say, we, we bring the proof of what we say. So that's how we try to, to progress in this dimension, and, and, we, and we, don't consider, uh, we don't consider it as a cost, uh, we consider it as a, as a benefit for, for all, including for us, I mean in terms of attractivity. Uh, you, you mentioned it, if we want to attract quality people to the young, but also uh, less young people, we want to attract the best people, and these are motivated by these dimensions. Same with investors, we, we start seeing credits, which are linked to, uh, you know, our performances uh, with regards to B Corp uh, points, for instance. Uh, the same with our customers, they, they bring questions to us. So all these people are, uh, stakeholders are putting positive pressure on us in terms of attractivity. And, and, and then it's about risk management. Uh, uh, you know, if we don't progress as a company, we are exposed to cost of resources, cost of energy. Uh, you know, cost of insurance, stuff like that. So in terms of risk management, we'd better move ahead. And the last thing is in terms of business development. Uh, progressing in this dimension is also an opportunity to, to develop new business for a company. Uh, not only about environment, but also in, in the other dimension. So that's really why we want to go ahead and move and move on. And frankly, uh, all these regulations in the European regulations we have mentioned just before, they are quite complex to understand and follow, honestly, for a company, even with the support of our auditors and so on. So we, we, we don't wait for it, we, we move on. Uh, we have picked the B Corp framework to allow us to you know, put figures on what we do. And so we consider we will be ready whatever the regulation will come uh, at the end of the year or later. That's how we do. And I have an intermediate question for you. I hear two people being responsible in terms of planet, ESG, sustainability. We have another responsibility than just the one versus the shareholder. We have a personal responsibility as company and as person. What do you think should be the outcome of the standards that we are now trying to make for Europe? Should they be tougher than the American, the international ones? Should they be softer? Because if they are softer, it will be easier. We will have more time to do. If they are tougher, we could have a lead position. What is your opinion about it? Uh, by the way, uh, Europe has already won the competition if we are to talk about sustainability. Just maybe one key figure to illustrate that. If we are talking about, in the equity world, um, assets under management, 81% are actually located in Europe. So if we compare to the US, it's around 10%, so more or less equal to the rest of the world. So in this competition, as you mentioned in your introduction regarding the uh, accounting uh, laws, uh, uh, norms, etc., uh, if we look at who are and where are actually the most responsible investors, and especially those who are not entering in greenwashing, we invest concretely, responsibly, with long-term view, uh, etc. They are in Europe, definitely. And inside Europe, definitely champions are French, Be uh, Belgium, and Dutch. Uh, that's, that's, that's the reality for the moment in the equity fields. If we look at uh, listed financing like bonds, definitely Europe is also number one. Uh, it, it's, of course, based on culture and also regulation. And that's very important, I, I've, on my point of view, to say, okay, for the moment, regulation is really focused on transparency, disclosure, 
granularity, so all about data, uh, quality of the ESG reporting. So that could be uh, experienced as a constraint, especially for the SMEs. Uh, but the next big thing for responsible finance or sustainable financing is impact measurement. And impact measurement, and this is our vision at Euronext, is definitely something as a peer on the greater opportunity for life sciences companies because they are, the, by definition, the most oriented companies to measure this impact. Of course, clean tech or environmental services, etc., are also eligible. But this one is the next big thing because it's important to keep in mind that sustainable financing, responsible investment are is to stay and it's just the beginning. And we observe that if regulators and European Commission is tough, as you said, and, and very demanding on that, it's because this is the beginning of the structuration of something very important. So you go for intellectual uh, protectionism, if I may call it like that. I don't know if it's... Pro Innovative yeah. intellectual protectionism. It's US and probably or another, China are, are money, great yeah. in this exercise, but uh, we have, a, we have a, a card in our game in Europe. One of the problems in doing that, Veronique, is that you have to have an access to a lot of information to correspond to all those uh, um, reporting requirements. Um, what is the most difficult one to, for you to, to do this? Um, what do you think about those SMEs who think that they will not be in the game, uh, for example? And how do you talk to your investors to motivate them to give you the information you need? Or do you punish them? Or do you motivate them? How do you do that? To get information to report, you mean? Huh? To have you reporting correctly and responsible as it should be, because that is your target. Huh? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So I think that, um, yes, it's of course access to reliable data and making sure that they can be, you know, assured by external auditor, because that's what we want. Huh? We want uh, our data to be, to be assured, to make sure that, you know, uh, as you say, we uh, limit the risk of greenwashing or sustainability washing so that the data can be, uh, you know, audited. So it's, it's, of course, you know, a lot of work. You're right. So um, it's probably a bit easier on the environmental side, because uh, now there is a bit more history on really measuring, you know, carbon emission or, or water consumption, etc. It's more difficult on the social side. And for a company like UCB, the impact we have is on the social side. Huh? It's really about, you know, uh, uh, basically improving life of, of uh, patients who take drugs, taking care of our employees. And, um, you know, so it's really the S part of ESG for us is where we have a material impact. And, uh, and you're right, you know, having a good view on what is the impact we have on population of patients across the globe. And uh, we can at least, you know, count the number of patients that um, can take our drugs. We can make sure that they are reimbursed. So we have index, you know, and we measure actually how we perform in terms of access for, to reimbursement for the patients that um, take UCB medicine. So we have published uh, a first index uh, two years ago, and we are now publishing our progress on this index. We are also looking at time to reimbursement. So... Um, we have internal index, an health, safety, and well-being index of the workforce of UCB, where we measure also how we do in terms of health, safety, and well-being of um, all our collaborators across the globe. But it's hard, and it's not standardized measured. So, um, so clearly, it's very difficult for also investors to compare us to other companies, because basically, uh, we actually created very transparently our measure. We disclose them. They are audited. But it's, it's a lot of work, and I, I can... Absolutely, you know, um, yes, it shows that for SME, that's very difficult because even for us, we struggle. We struggle to get access to all the reimbursement data across the globe, you know, and, uh, and to have the same quality of data. So uh, it's true that uh, I can imagine that, you know, for smaller companies, it's, it's a, really a burden. But do you, as will UCB in the next years to come, there may be a transition program, exclude some suppliers who, is not, who are not capable of Responding to your demands on respect of the planet or sustainability or governance or social? Uh, we have, we have, so we have science based targets huh, which are set. So, um, and in our science based target, we have a commitment that 60% of our supplier by emission will have carbon neutrality target in 2025. 
which means that you know it's a, it, it's a tough commitment and uh, we need our strategic supplier to really come with us huh, on this journey. So uh, currently we are more at the stage where we interact proactively with them, we support them and we really, you know, make sure that they are on the journey towards carbon neutrality, for example, but it will be the same on human rights, uh, where we have also, you know, a strong commitment to really uh, respect fully human rights across the supply chain. So. We are not at a time yet where we have said to suppliers we stop working with, uh, with you because you don't you know, um, have targets that are aligned with our, ours, but it will come, for sure, because we have this public commitment and you know, uh, we will deliver on it. So clearly you know, it will come uh, at a point where uh, if a supplier doesn't at least start the journey, you know, it will be part as price, quality and other criteria that come in the way we choose suppliers, for sure. So if I am not responding to your demands, I risk to be excluded. That's really what will happen. You, no, will, you it, will give me the time, but I will risk to be excluded. It's for, it's for a good reason. Yeah. No, no, okay. It's for yeah. a good reason. We, I, society I, don't, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I just want to know how, how you will act and how you will... Society is facing challenges. We have resources that we use financially to choose the supplier we want to work to. You know, if they don't commit to actually be with us on the journey to solve the challenges, why would we work with them? Yeah, okay, good. I turn to you, Tuma. You have some dreams from time to time. You even had a dream, but I don't want to talk about this one, to be in the taxonomy active, not only defending yourself how reducing the CO2 exhaust or something like that, but being solution-driven in that field. What is for you, in all those aspects, the things that blocks you? most or what prof is it a question of money is it a question of people is it a question of um, regulation what is for you the thing that would speed up your process of success for your company because it's it's you i, I understood that esg is for something for the future of your business very important yeah, I mean, the, the truth is that uh, I was talking about, you know, sharing value across the, the, the stakeholders uh, in, in a company. So it's easy said, easily said, it's less easily done. So really for us, the challenge, and I guess it's the same for every single company in the world, is to, uh, you know, find the right balance between the stakeholders. For instance, at IBA, we save uh, lives of 100,000. Uh, we just, uh, you know celebrated the 100,000 first patients saved by proton therapy. But for that, we also need to uh, you know, produce machines which consume a lot of energy. So where do we put the balance between energy and saving life? You know, uh, carbon footprint and saving life. Same, same between the shareholders and the employee. Where do we put the balance between the shareholders and the employee? One euro to the shareholder? How much for the employee? We just implemented dividend matching this year which is exactly that. One euro for a shareholder is one euro for the employee. That's, a, that's the way we found for you know, balancing this. And I can also give another example, finding the right balance between attracting the, 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 the newcomers and you know, environmental impact. How do we attract people today? The value of the company, of course, but also lease cars. Uh, and where do you find uh, the lease cars uh, afterwards? You know, in the traffic jam on the, on the road. So, we have to find the right balance between all these aspects, and that's really where the, the struggle is. But I guess it's the same for any company. And so you don't need any subsidies for innovative research projects from governments or European or local? Absolute, absolutely, yes. <laughs> uh, and that, that's the other aspect. I mean, I mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, ESG, sustainability in general, is also uh, an opportunity to develop new markets. Uh, and that's really key as well. I mean, uh, why do we have to move as a company? It is because we'd better be the first one to move and then wait for the competition to have taken all the new opportunities before us. So, of course, yes. yes I, th I think personally that for companies to make a, a really challenging change, because some companies are in a position where the product they make is absolutely not easy to be transferable to something that is sustainability Correct. So they will have to invest much more than they normally do in research or in uh, investment in machines and equipment. So I think if, they, if the banks are following them one way, but they don't, they have, they, that's already one thing, but they will need so much money 
that there could be real demands for help on, on all levels. So it's, I think some, somewhere the governance will have to take that into account. Europe has already made a budget free. free. Uh, I don't know what happens with that budget for the moment, but I think um, it's not a neglectable part, I think, in the, ch in the challenge for the companies. Now, I, I turn to you. You said that you are trying to do your best, but you miss a lot of information that could make you much more efficient in realizing the, your job as being not only the policeman, but a positive um, a companion for the people trying to solve their problems. What is it that you miss? Is there a solution? Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I'm, I'm, I hear a lot about yeah. uh, in Europe about the, the the plan of having a, a one yeah, access. One database. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is that a solution for you? That or? is a solution, but it will come too late uh, oh. because it's always uh, shifting in time. Uh, the unique database. So what we are doing is that we, we are trying to organize it ourselves on, on a level, on a sector level. Uh, for example, we are uh, really talking to the other banks to see if we at least can um, make sure that we don't ask, uh, each financial institution is not going to ask all of their customers uh, the same information. So we try to uh, agree on that and try to find solutions ourselves. However, for example, just to, to make the complexity uh, within Belgium very clear, um, the, the uh, energy uh, performance certificates are a very important uh, topic in terms of ESG, uh, especially banks have to know the energy performance of the building stock. In Flanders, there is a database which is accessible, but we can't stock the data, so we can keep it for a, a few months, and, but we can't use it. In Brussels, there is a database, but we can't access the database. And then in Wallonia, if I understood well, there is no database of uh, certificates. But actually, that's really a crucial element for banks because Europe is asking us to get a view on the, on the energy performance certificate. Mm -hmm. So if you ask for a solution, well, there I would say, dear government, help us in uh, tackling those kind of issues. Uh, okay. Because uh, if, if we get some help there, uh, that would be great. It's, an, uh, it's a message, I think, that is of importance to, to help because it's a real hurry. Delivered. Last question to you, and then we stop because we are already over time. So, uh, <laughs> SMEs, I'm focusing on SMEs. What I hear is that they are willing to, to do, but they are not capable to do. Because they are trying, but they do not know exactly what to do. Who has to help them? Should we leave them in the hands of their, their accountants, their auditors, who will tell them what to do like they normally do in accounting? Should we leave them in the hands of a lot of people that are standing up recently claiming that they have the solution versus a budget that is not neglectable, although the standards are still not finished? So they are already claiming, claiming that they can give you certificates. Should we, what, what should we do? How can we help the companies being educated in the challenge they have to respond to, because they will all have to follow. The small and medium enterprises will be in the trickle-down effect of the questions of the big ones, and will have to be ESG, they will not escape. That is already for sure. How can we help them? Uh, so, uh, f first of all, Euronext has um, already engaged some concrete actions to help uh, issuers, and um, last week we have published the second version of our ESG guideline for reporting for the issuer. So you can visit the Euronext website and download it uh, for free. Uh, anyone can go to the Euronext website. It's for free for the entire ecosystem and you can download it. Also, always for uh, um, uh, issuers, we have uh, launched a couple of years ago a practice named ESG advisory. That's uh, definitely consulting, as you, as you mentioned, but with a, a real and concrete tailor-made approach. The purpose of Euronext is to maximize the valuation of the company on the financial market. And so that's why ESG is part of this valuation. So definitely we have a role and we also have an interest to make companies eligible to responsible investment, green financing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the main advice for the SMEs is, and uh, for the non-quoted funds, uh, it's not only about outsourcing and internal capabilities. This is always the same story if 
top management, CEO, CFO, board, if it exists, are not convinced that sustainability and responsibility are value creating for long term, okay, no, that's a no-go. And you can uh, hire all the consultants of the world, uh, you will fail in this, um, in this journey. So that's firstly based on a strong conviction from the top management, advisors, and, and, and boards. Uh, first of all, if you have to outsource something because you have a lack of expertise, staffing, or anyway, resources internally, that's a mix. You have to partner with your consultant, your auditors, uh, any way you choose. And because the, value of the, the values of the company, your achievements and your objectives as yours, and anybody out, outside of the company can decide for you what is green, what is not green, what is sustainable, what is responsible. The role of the ESG consultant, I mean, is more to uh, uh, save a part of your workload and also help you to uh, have the better trajectory according to your budget, your um, business industry, uh, of course, and your, uh, your resources. It's always a question of transparency, uh, honestly, and of course, uh, trajectory, and this is for the moment what regulators, investors, and bankers uh, are looking for. Maybe there is need to a certain new group of people that are really, I don't know, be certified to help companies. I don't know how to do that. But there must be something that allows companies, because they don't even cannot make the judgment, they are approached by people that tell them, give me 20,000 euro and I, you will be ESG free. No problem anymore. With it. The people pay it and they have nothing. So there is something in the market that I think maybe regulators or political people should address one day to find out how to handle this, because otherwise it will be a big market of a lot of money spent and maybe not the results we want to have. I hope you will... We are 15 minutes over time, I think. So um, I really apologize, but I give the floor to Sylvie. Thank you very much, uh, Luc, for, this, uh, for moderating this interesting debate. And also, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, thank you for sharing your uh, experience. I would like now to thank all those who have contributed to the success of this event. Of course, our sponsors. I would like to thank GSK, Janssen Pharmaceutica, Universels, Eming, Orsband Clark, PWC, Belfius, and Euronext. I would like to thank also the BioWin team, uh, especially. Uh, Alexandra Skitekat and Marine Di Vincenzo. Thank you, Alexandra and Marine, and thank you to all the team uh, for your contribution uh, to this event. Now, it's high time to start the festivities, so I would like to invite you to take a drink and to share this happy moment uh, with uh, all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.